Okay, so call to order, and would everybody please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United flag. States of America and, and to the Republic, Republic, which stands one nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice. And justice for all. Okay. So thank you uh, for those of you that are joining us remotely. We have a bunch of presentations to get through tonight. Hopefully you uh, saw the snowman. <laughs> Singing snowman, if you haven't. Follow CM Super. What's the, what's the? <laughs> at, at CM Schools underscore super. On Twitter. And it's, uh, it's really quite good, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just leave you with that little teaser. <laughs> so whenever, Ron, you and the crew are ready. Okay, I'll, uh, I, ready for the superintendent's report? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, um, looks like, Bill, I, uh, you've disabled, it says disabled screen sharing, so you'll need to um, enable it if you don't mind. Yep. Uh, um, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to begin um, with... Go. Okay, um, I'm going to begin with with a, a presentation that um, is going to let's see here. Uh, um, all right, I'm going to begin with a presentation um, that is a bit of a follow up on um, on a conversation we had last time where I, where I discussed the probability that there would be some testing in, in um, schools in Suffolk County. Um, at present, um, you know, the infection rate in the county, uh, believe it or not, today, I believe, uh, hit 8.2%. Mm -hmm. So we do have um, the highest infection rate we've seen in a long time. Um, and the testing in the county um, has been ramped up. Pre, you know, we, we essentially started having this conversation with the Department of Health earlier in the year. Um, and, you know, once, once we knew um, that we had to, to do this, uh, we really started to come together and put together a plan um, to, to see how we could make this work for our schools. Um, so I'm going to present that so that the community can truly understand, um, you know, what it is we would need to do. Um, as you know, we did put out a willingness to test survey um, because if we have to test, as you'll see in here, we will need to reach a certain threshold of willing testers um, to be able to keep our schools open. So I'm, I'm gonna go through this now and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. Um, so to begin, um, this has been months and months of, of challenge. You know, we're, we're you know, about 10 months into um, dealing with either the, you know, pending pandemic or living through the pandemic um, and, and the ebbs and flows that have uh, presented itself. You know, we saw a little bit of a reprieve over the summer where things loosened up a little bit, and now we're on the other tail end. Um, we've talked about some of the unprecedented challenges, whether it's, you know, trying to continue to educate our children and the, the stress that is on teachers and administrators and staff to make that happen, uh, but the impact on our students themselves and their families. Um, when, you know, things like, um, you know, having to follow uh, along on, um, you know, the Google Meets and things like that uh, from, you know, a, a, a remote location is, is not as easy um, as, you know, you might think, <laughs> or, or maybe it's more difficult than, than anyone imagined. Um, but clearly it has had an impact on students. It had an impact on families and an impact on staff. Um, and what we've tried to do throughout this process is ensure that our communication um, is as good as it can be so that everybody truly understands um, that we are doing the best we can uh, to meet the demands, you know, in increasing demands of the pandemic to educate all the students in Center Merchis as best we can. Um, you know, I think that early on, you know, when we were building plans for this, um, we had a certain perception of what this might bring, um, a perception that we were going to go back to March. And what I mean by that was that the perception was we're going to put 
a reopening plan in place. And in the governor's own words, he, he was saying in August, they're not going to trust the school district. This is an issue of public health. Parents are going to want to understand the information for themselves. He was basically saying, parents, push your districts, challenge them, because you need to know that your kids are going to be safe in schools. And many people thought that we'd be closed in the second week of September. Well, I think we've learned a lot since then. And I can tell you, I've been actively involved in conversations at the county level um, and with, with representatives in the governor's office about the kinds of things that we've put in place for our schools. Um, and, you know, just November 16th, a couple of weeks ago, in a press conference, the governor turned and said, what I'm saying is we've learned a lot since then, and schools are actually the safe place. And what we hear a lot in Albany now is that we need to keep our schools open. A couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago, I posted my five reasons why on my personal Twitter account, my five reasons why I thought schools should remain open um, and why schools actually have to remain open. I think that students learn more when they're physically present in school. And, and I think that that's because that's what school is meant to be. And that's what our kids know. That's what our teachers know. And we can be truly most effective when kids are physically present in school. So that's what we're striving for. Whenever we do our, reload, uh, our look back periods, we're trying to make sure that we're doing every week, everything we can to increase the contact time and increase the in-person time for kids in schools. I think kids are safer physically and psychologically in school than not. I think they're safer physically because in schools, we are doing an amazing amazing job of maintaining social distancing, <clears throat> keeping universal masking, um, and ensuring that we're doing hand washing um, and following the basic protocols that keep kids physically safe. Outside of school, kids are free to gather more and potentially not follow those protocols as they do when they are in school. And we are teaching them consistently about those and reinforcing those protocols. I believe psychologically they are also safer. So physically and psychologically, from a mental health standpoint, kids that are in school are engaged and they're interacting in positive ways with others in school, in a school setting. And I think that that's more normal. And therefore, I do believe they are, they are safer psychologically as well. We know, and I will show you some data in a little while, that there is a lower transmission of this disease in our schools. And if there's a lower transmission of, of COVID in our schools, keeping our schools open keeps teachers safe, keeps kids safe, and it helps to reduce community spread. All that's out there right now is talking about the idea that it's small family gatherings where, where the community spread is really starting to happen more now. I believe it fulfills, I would never in a million years call our teachers daycare providers, but it fulfills, school fulfills a community need for childcare for our essential workers so that they can be doing the things that they need to do for our communities. It also keeps our workforce productive and our economy viable. Keeping schools open allows parents to get to work. It allows them to, to be productive in their work and it keeps our economy moving. And that's something that's critical, especially when we're seeing um, you know, the shortfalls in uh, state revenues and things all related to a slowdown of an economy. So the governor put together his microcluster strategy, and it, basically it's a close look at trends in communities. So they are monitoring those trends and they're detecting spread levels across New York State and they're identifying small locales by zip code or even smaller neighborhoods that have higher infection rates and they are looking to identify where there is community spread of the disease. Once they identify an area of concern, they create a specific area of focus um, for the viral transmission and they zero in on that. And they call it either a yellow, an orange or a red zone. Once those cluster zones are identified, they implement restrictions accordingly based on how significant the spread is and the infection rate is. So this could be the pausing of non-essential economic activities. And you see in yellow there, the transition to remote education limiting mass gatherings, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we've seen, we've all experienced, but this is the process by which the governor decides how he's going to move places into yellow, orange, or red zones. And then in any of those zones, there's a, a clear emphasis on increasing community testing um, and improving compliance and enforcement. So they will supply, they will provide supplies of PPE to those communities and they will 
ensure that they increase testing to determine how significant the, the, um, the infection rate is and also to identify any asymptomatic um, patients so that we can minimize spread. According to the guidance, um, schools in a yellow zone must, and this is again, when, when the microcluster zones are identified, any school in a yellow zone must test 20% of in-person students, faculty and staff over a two week period immediately following that designation. So if we were identified, we would have two weeks to test about 370 people. If testing uh, results reveal that the positivity rate is lower, then the school no longer has to test until such time that they would be, that zone would be identified as orange or red, which have dis different testing requirements. But if we can prove that our schools are safe and our infection rate is lower than that of our community, we would be able to move on, keep our schools open and not have to test any longer. Um, apart, and essentially, the last bullet indicates that that's a su sufficient demonstration that in-person instruction is not a driver of, of uh, or a vector of spread. Um, you know, again, I, I talked earlier about putting together a plan. Um, this is a plan that I developed with a colleague of mine. Um, Hampton Bays was the first school that needed to test um, as a preemptive testing for um, heading into a yellow zone. So I worked with Lars Clemenson. He and I spent a weekend really just drilling into what it would take to actually bring testing into a school. And we, we developed this plan. It's a 10 step process for schools to follow to implement school based testing. One of the things that I was striving for in this was make it very manageable to follow, very easy to follow. I wanted it to be replicable and I wanted it to be scalable to any size school district. And I think we accomplished that. Um, when, when you look at the plan, I'll just, I'll just pull it up quickly. Um, and I'll just, it basically, it, it starts with a uh, a description of the, the microcluster zone initiative. It talks about red zones, orange zones, and yellow zones. And in specific, this, this, this is what I would refer to as a, as a dynamic source document. Dynamic because it gets updated all the time. I spent some time over the weekend updating it again with the most recent guidance. Um, and you can see here, uh, you know, it's very difficult when you watch the county and you try to see, oh, well, I, as I indicated, 8.2% in Suffolk County testing um, just yesterday. Well, that sounds like we should all be in a red zone. However, one of the factors that the governor added to this is hotel, is hotel, excuse me, hospital capacity. Um, hospital capacity is an important driver. If, you know, we are very fortunate to have 11 hospitals in Suffolk County. Those are, a, that's a lot of beds for people. And therefore, um, as long as there is hospital capacity, it could prevent a particular uh, municipality from moving into a yellow, orange, or red zone. Um, as, it, as it moves forward, there is um, information about the testing. I talked about the yellow, but in an orange zone, 20% of in-person students and staff over a month would have to be tested. And that's 10% per month, uh, excuse me, 10% every two weeks in a red zone. Uh, and that is perpetual now. So if a zone is labeled orange, they would have to test every month, 20%, 10%. And so it's ongoing testing, testing every week. Um, and that would basically mean that we'd have to test about 100 students or staff a week uh, to, to keep ourselves um, open. Same thing for a red zone, except um, it's 30% over the course of a month and the testing has to be spread out over 15% um, over two weeks. So there's clearly a, a need for testing in Suffolk County. I've cited some of the information and, and most interesting things that, that um, the data points to with regard to Suffolk County and its impact. Um, but some of the things that we've put in this plan are a willingness to test survey that has already gone out to our community. At present, we have well over 400, probably close to about 500 people that are willing to test in our school community. That would be enough if we were designated to have to test 20%. Um, the next process would be a consent to test. That, would, could, that could be paper and pencil, or it would have to be, or we would use a digital consent. Um, and all of these documents, um, it, it is a source document because everything in here is a link to um, a document that uh, another sort, uh, resource that provides support. But essentially, um, 
The process is pretty simple. Uh, it goes through a 10 step process and there are stations involved. And what I'll show you is that, and actually I will go to a, a map so I can talk a little bit about what the testing site would look like. The map is, is very clear. You would walk in and I'll follow my cursor here. You'd, you'd out in the hall, you would come in, you would basically get a, a screening. We would take your temperature. We would determine that um, you were, uh, we had consent to test. We would go inside. We would answer a couple of screening questions. Basically, uh, everybody that's in school is asymptomatic. What we are doing in school is looking for asymptomatic individuals to test because, again, what we're trying to determine is um, people who are symptomatic typically are staying home these days and they're taking care of themselves and they are going to get tested. However, when people come into school, if they are asymptomatic, that's where we have concern because asymptomatic spread is a significant driver in, in the spread of this disease. Um, students would then, or staff would come in, they would go to this station right here, station two, they would be asked some screening questions, and then they would be invited over to station three where they would be able to, and they would com just complete a uh, demographic information. They would go to station three here, Station three would be a very shallow nasal swab that would be conducted by an RN, one of our nurses. Um, and the nurses would be able to literally in uh, five circles one way, five circles the other way, um, and be able to take that, bring it over to station four, where they would put, um, where they would put that with a reagent and that reagent and set a, an, an egg timer for 15 minutes. The students or staff would wait over here, socially distanced for 15 minutes, um, and then they would actually be able to get their test read. Uh, they would come back, they would sit at an education station, um, and at the education station, they would be told of the, the result. If they were a positive, they would be as, as escorted to an isolation room, just like we would do with any positive or person under investigation for COVID symptoms. We would isolate them. Um, if they were negative, they would be told basically that, you know, you're doing a good job, continue to wear a mask, continue to socially distance, that kind of thing. And then they would be escorted out. Um, this would be all people, if, if we were supported by the Suffolk County Department of Health, it would be all Suffolk County Department of Health nurses. Otherwise, it would be our own people, our own staff members uh, with an RN overseeing this entire thing, one of our own people. Um, and then the data gets reported in real time at station seven um, by one of our clerical who is now uh, already cleared through what's referred to as the eclair system. And the eclair system is the state repository for, for, um, for where the testing results go. And basically, um, I'm gonna exit out here. Okay. Um, so, so basically, it is a very, it's a, it's a very simple program. Um, we have a testing in schools tracker built into there as well. And in that testing in schools, you can see this is where we have tested um, over the course of the last couple of weeks since the 19th of November. We have administered in Suffolk County through this plan um, almost 3,000 tests. Uh, and we've had about 40 positives for a 1.44 positivity rate. That's what you see over here. Um, and I could say that uh, typically we're shooting for about 200 tests in any given day um, to be administered. But I could say that East Islip in one day um, tested 501 um, individuals. So it really is, is one of those things that sounds like, how can you be doing a medical procedure in a school? And this seems you know, unreal. It, it really is something that is, uh, once you observe it, um, and I have been to most of those testing sites just for a, a quick drop in to see how everything's going. Um, it really is one of those things that you look at and say, this is, this is actually quite manageable um, and not very invasive at all for, uh, for our students or our staff. So it really is uh, nothing more than what some of us are referring to as an aggressive nose pick, um, which some of our students are used to. Um, these are some frequently asked questions. Um, where will the test come from? New York State Department of, you know, one of the most important things is this has to be free to all our students and staff. And the New York State Department of Health provides these rapid tests to us. They are, um, they, they come to us for free. 
um, and we just provide, uh, you know, we just repurpose staff a little while to, to be able to administer this testing. Um, again, who will administer the test? Um, schools are responsible to provide appropriately trained staff to test. And the, the test is actually um, this Binax Now um, uh, test that there is a New York State Department of Health training presentation and any individual that goes through the rapid testing um, uh, protocols and training presentation is permitted to test. Um, and again, no, no person um, would be tested by anyone who is not an RN. Um, and that, that would be very clear. If we had children, uh, parents that wanted to be there with their children, uh, we, we will be working out a way that parents will be permitted uh, to join the appointment with their children and be tested with their, with their child. Um, so that's something that hopefully, you know, alleviates any concerns for younger students that, that uh, parents might have. Um, after the test administration, uh, how long will it take? Uh, as I indicated, it's about 15 minutes. It's actually exactly 15 minutes as a timer set. Um, and we, uh, you know, are, are able to deliver the results immediately. Um, our own staff, as I indicated earlier, will be reporting the test results in the New York State database. Um, and if somebody wanted to go, as long as they were testing within the same testing window as us, and they said, well, hey, listen, I'm willing to get tested, but I'd rather do it on my own, they could go outside uh, to any other facility, get tested, um, and then bring those results back to us, and it could count towards our, um, our school results. So with that, I'm... I'm Again, a quick overview. Uh, what I'd like to emphasize is that this really is a very, very manageable plan. Uh, the plan that we put together that I, that I showed you on the screen is actually being used statewide now. Um, Suffolk County really took the lead on this because we had such strong relationships with our local Department of Health, who I, who I really commend. Um, and, and the people at the, at the county level that supported us. So now we do have um, a situation where, you know, Suffolk County is being looked at throughout the entire state as a leader in this because our plan is very strong. So I, I would be willing to take any questions from the board or, you know, perhaps given the nature of this, George, maybe even from the community. If yeah, I'd questions. certainly be fine with that. I appreciate the thorough, you know, presentation and certainly the document you've put together, Ron, and uh, I know how hard we're working to make sure that it's a safe and comfortable thing for everybody. Um, I just am keeping my fingers crossed that we don't ever have to implement it. Well, well, I, I'm, I'm, I, I think it's a matter of when George not. Yeah, not, I know. You know, I know. I think that I think that the way the rates are going, uh, I think that we're going to be looking at, um, you know, probably more, more, more testing than not in the county. Yeah, and we're prepared, and we'll be, and we are 100. percent we are 100% ready to do it if we had to. Yep. Um, so please know that. Yep. Safely and comfortably. And mm -hmm. um, so appreciate all your hard work there. So, Bill, I know um, we're going to break protocol a little bit. If anybody has any questions on this specific presentation um, that Dr. Massara just gave us, please. I know I want to, I know for me, he answered both of my questions and I thank him for that first that it'll be the RNs who will be doing the swabbing and second that parents will be allowed to accompany their children because especially for an elementary school kid or even a middle school kid or high school kid most kids have their parents with them when they have any kind of medical procedure or anything so I appreciate that as well thank you mm -hmm. yeah so we have anyone who's got uh don't see anybody Okay. And, and you know what? I mean, even, even later on, yep. if, if somebody gets to us, uh, we do have, you know, three presentations to get through today. So I, I'll move on. And if anybody in the community does have any questions, if they could, you know, save them, write them down and um, be happy to, or even call me in the office at any time. I'm happy to speak to anybody about this stuff. Um, Thank so, you. Yeah, you got it. Let me go to the, Thanks. let me see what the, uh, okay. I'm going to go over to, um, this is a presentation that um, Raina Ingolia has put together, um, our assistant superintendent on um, the school climate survey that we have recently pushed out. So Raina, do you want me to, I'll advance for you Raina whenever you. Okay, I'll let you know. Uh, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to uh, present to you. So for about a year or so, 
Uh, well, about a year ago, um, we uh, started uh, participating in LICE, Long Island Consortium for Equity and Excellence. And, and basically um, those workshops, we, we have a Center Riches team that is involved in those workshops. And um, they, they, they basically get the gurus of all different areas of program and instruction um, and bring them to Eastern Suffolk BOCES uh, to work with um, pretty much every district on, uh, in Suffolk County um, participates at some point. So uh, you can forward, uh, you can continue. So one of the outcomes from our LICE experiences last year was the concept of an annual uh, school climate survey. And um, so the Department of Education has a school climate survey and which is supported by the organization that, that's quoted at the top. Uh, school climate refers to a way the school fosters safety, promotes a supportive academic and disciplinary and physical environment while encouraging uh, and maintaining respectful, trusting and caring relationships throughout the school community. So it really is um, the perception of how kids um, feel, their perceptions about the school environment, their perception about their, their academic components, extracurricular components, um, but it also um, has a separate survey for the parents and for both instructional hey boys. and, and non-instructional Do you want to watch Amazing Race at eight? <laughs> okay. I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Long Island Consortium for Equity and Excellence, you know, they really um, pushed, you know, the schools, encouraged the schools to kind of start this as a, you know, an annual practice. And just coincidentally, it is um, part of the typical self-study needs assessment and school improvement process. So you know, the goal this year really was to get a baseline for Santa Mariches. Uh, the survey is voluntary. It's anonymous. Um, it's really it's really for students three to twelve. They don't typically survey younger students. They certainly could if they wanted to, um, because there 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 are links for elementary students, middle school students, and uh, high school students. Um, typically, third and fourth grade is when students start to be able to participate in these types of things. Uh, the questions are organized into the three domains: engagement, safety, and environment. Uh, Ron, you could go to the next slide. Thank you. And this, this is a sample report um, of what the data looks like. It's a breakdown by topic. So within engagement, um, they talk about language competence, relationships, participation, and safety. It's emotional safety, physical safety, bullying, substance abuse, emergency readiness and management and environment, physical environment, instructional environment, mental health and discipline. And on the right side is basically a scale. Every question is scaled through the strongly agree to strongly disagree range. So in all of these topics, they're asked a series of questions and the response is always you know, strongly agree through um, strongly disagree. And the next slide. So this is just another, the, the data, when we get the results, and this is um, the great thing about the platform that we're using, it allows us to disaggregate the data in a, very, a variety of ways. So we can disaggregate by the domains, the three main domains, by the topics, by the questions themselves, and then break down by gender, race, ethnicity, grade, and school. And um, with the work that we're doing uh, with diversity um, and equity, I think this information will prove very useful in some of those conversations as well. So when we get this sample data and we get this, uh, this data report, we'll be able to look at this. It, it will basically um, be relevant to every, all of our initiatives and in varieties of avenues, including, you know, the, the you know, the, the uh, diversity committee um, that we started this year. Um, so before I go into pair, just to, to backtrack on the survey, the survey is currently available. There's a link on the main page of the website. Um, the, there's all kinds of informational documents on the, you know, within that, within that web page, it's, it's open right now. I'm going to keep it open for a while since it is the holiday season. I know we've uh, surveyed uh, quite a bit this year. Um, 
So if we can encourage, you know, everyone encourage a few people to take the survey. Um, it's anonymous. The data is being kept in-house um, in the future. If we ever want to become part of a comparative study, that's always an option. But this is really just Senator mm -hmm. Rich's information that's going to stay with Senator Rich's. And it's hopefully going to inform, um, you know, where our challenges are, where the areas we need to improve. We get a tremendous amount of feedback every day from our teachers, our parents, and our students. Um, but we know that, that maybe some people are hesitant to, you know, to really speak their minds, um, you know, person to person. So this is just another avenue um, where people can safely communicate their thoughts um, and ideas and um, we can use that feedback uh, to grow and to, to set goals and grow as we try to do every year. So you notice as part of the, the school climate survey that there, there is a piece of, of social emotional. So these things are interconnected, but this next piece um, really focuses on um, individual students. So this survey um, is from an organization called Partnerships, Partnerships in Education and Resilience Pair. Um, and they're out of Harvard University. Um, so, and they are completely focused on social emotional health. So we have talked about, I know um, the Health and Wellness Committee has talked about um, an, a very specific SEL screener, and this would be for grades three to 12. Um, and basically what it does is it creates a social emotional portrait um, and it will have, you know, um, we will be able to get compiled data for the school, but we will be able to um, see individual data as well for students who um, we may not know that there's, there's an underlying issue. We may, we may not know um, a certain feeling that they've been having, and it'll help that early detection process that we're, we're really um, trying to tackle, you know, with our counselors in our CST processes, um, so any student, student who participates in this, um, again, it's, we, it is not mandatory. Um, there is a, an opt-out um, option, um, but we know that you know, the more that we know about our kids early on, the, the more we are capable of um, helping them. Um, this presentation is on the website and all of these underlined areas, these are all links to additional resources. Um, uh, for, from PEAR and the other element of the PEAR piece is that this, this data piece mm -hmm. will become part of their data profile and will be alongside their data profile in, in Right Reason Technology. Again, this is not data that we are doing anything with outside of Senate Riches in terms of, um, you know, data that, you know, we send assessment data to the state and all that stuff. This is only Senate Riches only data um, and this particular uh, survey is, is um, it, it will be given to individuals. They will have an ID number. It won't be any person, it won't be any uh, PII information, um, but they will have an ID number. So if there are things that um, come up in the screenings that we can talk to the students and obviously inform the parents and so on. These are the types of topics that are covered in the pair survey, in the, in the SEL screening. Um, you can see they're a bit more specific than the, the school climate, um, but there is somewhat of an overlap. Um, like, you know, like the last bullet, sense of belonging, there's going to be an overlap in the school climate survey and that. Um, but this is very specific to individuals and how they see themselves in school versus school climate, where it's like how they perceive the, the, their environment in the school. Um, so this is, I would say, definitely um, a more self-reflection piece versus, you know, evaluating and um, communicating attitudes about the environment um, in school. You can go to the next slide. So, you know, when I think, um, you know, school climate and social emotional learning, you know, they, they are um, truly interconnected. You know, when I think of school climate and SEL at Santa Merch's you know, I had a lot of trouble with this page because it, it was really busy and it was busier at one point because I had so many things up there because um, our students are truly involved in some amazing activities. And sometimes it's just their positive interactions with themselves, with their teachers. Um, and these are the things that we build on here. Um, you know, student activity in action, there's a million things I could list under there from sports to extracurriculars to community service. Um, 
And those things build positive school climate. Um, our counseling supports the leadership, um, student uh, created, um, you know, wall murals and, you know, work posted. Um, so I, I tried to just put up some general things, but we could all name probably a thousand things underneath all of these topics um, that truly build our positive school climate. And our goal really is to make sure that positive school climate continues and that, you know, especially in these times where school climate, it, it is really hard, you know, to maintain it. it it's, it's um, you know, incredibly challenging. I think our kids, our teachers, our parents, our staff are all doing a phenomenal job um, trying to, you know, to, to still embrace, you know, but school is, is very different this year. And it may not be like the best time to survey people because there, there is that, you know, kind of, you know, that, that challenging kind of stressful environment, but all the more reason to get the feedback at this time, um, because we know we'll continue to grow. Um, and we know the more positive school can be for kids, we know that they'll be more successful. So this, um, you know, the, the quote in the cloud, um, you know, really, I think summarizes really well uh, what, what we're talking about and what we continue to try to do. Um, these visuals, I actually borrowed this from a teacher who did a PD session this week um, at the middle school, Teresa Horshevsky. Um, a lot of the work that Trevor McKenzie does really, it, he's, a, he's an English teacher, but a lot of the work that he does, he does a lot of professional development work throughout the country. Um, on inquiry, but the work that he does is very, very social emotional oriented. Um, and um, if you look how all these, I think this visual really paints a beautiful picture about how all these elements can work together um, and how you know we are working on all these elements to make sure that they exist in our schools so our kids can have the best experience possible. And these are just some of the resources um, that are available out there. Some of the things that we've um, used in our PD sessions and will continue to use with our students and staff um, in terms of keeping, creating positive school climate and making sure that we have, um, you know, a very comprehensive SEL program for individual students and for, you know, whole school programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raina. Appreciate that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Raina. Um, I, you know, I think that it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the data, you know, plays out the school climate survey in, in such a, you know, kind of a peculiar year. Um, this will be the first time we're administering that survey. So it's going to serve as a baseline. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I do, you know, think that the data is going to be a little bit different, you know, just because of the fact that we are, this is a very different kind of year. Um, but certainly we're going to glean what, what we can from it um, and try to improve what, you know, our practices um, as best we can. So thank you for that, Raina. That was a great sure. um, overview of that. All right. So we do have um, one more um, presentation that I'm going to get to here. And Ron, while you're bringing that up uh, on the surveys, yeah. are, are the parents automatically going to get um, those, that information on their, on their kids? Or is there some process to request that? Or what do you envision there? <laughs> So for the, for the SEL piece, um, they're going to, um, PEAR is going to have individual reports. So the parents will get the individual reports. And that, and, and you know, it's, it's different, but similar to something that I had done in a previous district where we implemented universal screening uh, for social and emotional instability, um, where we, um, we did the same, you know, and we use that as a baseline. All right. Um, Okay, so the, the next presentation is, is a presentation um, that we're basically referring to as pandemic effects on the academic, social, and emotional well being of students in, in Santa Mariches. Um, you know, it's very clear that, uh, you know, like I just said, we're going to have a, a, a baseline on social, emotional, uh, or, or of, of um, school climate, um, but it's going to be a baseline that is in some ways perhaps not entirely accurate because it's, it's such a peculiar year, uh, but it's important data because we really need to understand um, how kids are feeling about what their school environment looks like. Um, and clearly 
Um, the pandemic has exacerbated, we know that the pandemic has exacerbated mental health issues. We know that the pandemic has, has created all kinds of stressors for kids, for staff, for everyone. Um, and so one, one of the things we wanted to look at was what does that, re what, what are we seeing as the impact? So we asked the principals to dig into their data um, in a number of areas. And I'm gonna go through those areas in a little while, but I, I, ideally we were trying to see where could we pull data that, that shows us something and, and what does that data actually mean for our kids? Um, you know, in terms of an overview, what I can say is that, oh boy, sorry about that. Uh, uh, in terms of an overview, um, there's, there are several studies um, that look at, you know, oftentimes we look at what's referred to as the summer slide, you know, the, the couple of months, um, you know, in Europe, kids are off for eight weeks and in, 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 you know, America, they're sometimes 10 to 12 weeks. Um, and so the, there's questions about the, um, the different models of education and what does that summer slide really mean? Um, so based on data from that and based on um, other situations, whether it be natural disasters and things like that, um, a, a group of researchers, Kufeld leading them, um, basically came up with a model for what it would look like um, in terms of the law, what he referred to as learning losses for um, kids because of the pandemic. And essentially they, their statement was that students are likely to enter school with more variability in their academic skills than under normal circumstances. So for instance, you're in a, in a first grade classroom and your kids come into you on a reading level from C up to J maybe in, in your class, wide range. That, that, that might be now kids coming in from an A to a K, you know, like kids could be just a much wider range and a lot of variability in, in the readiness levels of kids. Um, and I always choose the word readiness above ability, because I think that that speaks to kids more so. If we talk about ability, that's static. That means that that's what kids are capable of. If we talk about readiness, we talk about a continuum of learning where kids move along at a pace that's suitable for them. So it's important to, to understand that distinction. Uh, but however, the, the research that, that they looked at yielded these projections of where students would fall in 2020. And basically what they said was that they would come in with about 63 to 68% of the learning gains in literacy relative to a typical school year. So that means a, a loss of anywhere from, you know, 37 to 30, 32 to 37% of the gains that they would normally have gotten um, in math. And again, literacy is everywhere. Kids are walking around, they're reading things that they're, they're constantly learning literacy skills mm -hmm. in their everyday life. They're constantly reading. Math is a little bit different. Math is something that is put in front of you and you practice and you learn uh, and you learn so sequentially. So math is a little bit different. So not surprisingly, the, learn, the, the losses in math are much more significant kids are coming in with 37 to 50% of the learning gains in math. So knowing that, that that's what the, that's what the pandemic, the, the researchers are telling us the pandemic effects are. Um, some of this research came from this article here, Accelerate, Don't Remediate, an instructional framework for meeting the needs of most vulnerable students after COVID closures. This was in the Journal of um, Instructional, in Instruction, Leadership and Instruction. And I actually, this was the article that uh, I'm an editor on this journal. Um, and I was assigned this, this article to proof um, and basically uh, edit and come up with the, the, the final version um, that we put towards the editorial board. And it was uh, ultimately published in that peer reviewed journal. So, but the, the interesting thing about this, accelerate, don't remediate. I remember when I first got this article, I thought, that's interesting, you know, and what an interesting idea. And, and it's so in line with my philosophy of setting high expectations for kids. Because part of the premise in this article was that when we have kids who are coming in and maybe have lost something in a previous year's learning, what we need to do is not lower expectations, not say that, well, if we want the exit outcome to be a JK reader for a second grader, well, what, why would we take that and say that instead of that, we'll, have, we'll change the exit outcome to an H. 
We don't want to do that. What we want to do is keep the bar high and we want to try to accelerate the learning. Essentially, the researchers are suggesting that the model that we need to use is to not try to catch the kid up on every little fact that they missed the previous year, but just accelerate the learning. And what they find is that because of the resilience factor that kids have, they actually can catch up as long as you put those supports in place for them. Um, the, uh, some of the other factors, um, and this comes from uh, some research through International Baccalaureate, um, are the idea of this idea of whole child education. So to support development, it is essential to maintain the commitment to providing holistic education and not be pressurized to focus predominantly on academic results. And this comes from Cardinal, who, who basically is indicating that if you can focus on the social emotional activities, you can recover the, the motivation and engagement and learning that helps students positively adjust to, the, to these new academic demands and challenges. Um, so again, in a nutshell, there are some key things that are important to mitigate the effects of these pandemic losses. Um, and according to Cardinal, there are five things that can really help. First off, we need to explicitly work toward development of skills that support resilience. Again, that idea, you, he you heard that when Raina was talking about um, some of the, um, the supports in terms of the pair, wor the work that pair is doing um, through Harvard, but resilience is critical. Kids need to learn to be resilient if they are going to overcome challenges. A positive school environment. And you, again, re repetitive here. If we are creating the positive school environment where kids are welcome, kids feel challenged, kids are challenged appropriately, and they are, they are supported by their teachers, and that positive school environment, they're supporting each other in their learning, and they're taking ownership over their learning, that's a positive school, school environment. That's something that gets kids over, a, uh, and, and it helps to mitigate the impact of pandemic losses. Using assessments to support, support teaching and learning. This is what we are doing every day. We are utilizing formative assessments to find out where kids are and address them along a continuum of readiness. Um, and if we are using them well, and what I would argue is that as difficult as it has been, one of the things that, one of the benefits we're gonna, when we come out the other side, we are going to be better for it. Our teachers are going to be better for it and our instructional institutions, educational institutions are gonna be better for it because we have learned to take traditional teaching and utilize and leverage technology like never before. And now we can utilize those assessments. We can utilize the data that we get from those assessments to really target the readiness levels of kids and support them better. Um, student agency and having kids take set goals and, and, um, and implement goal setting in their learning is a critical component that can also, um, you know, mitigate these uh, impact of pandemic losses. And then finally, differentiation, making sure that what we are doing is creating personalized learning environments, again, targeting the readiness levels of kids based on assessment data we have so that we know where kids are at and where we want to get them to. So if we can get a baseline, understand how far we think we can take kids and push them to that goal, um, I think that we can, we can certainly um, do wonderful things for our kids. So just a couple of these areas, um, the focus on, uh, on resilience, um, uh, according to Cahill and, and his group of researchers, um, there are four areas higher levels of social competence, problem solving skills, sense of autonomy and self-efficacy, and sense of purpose, hope or meaning are, are the four areas um, that you need to focus to teach um, resilience. And then obviously the, the positive school climate, we talked about that, uh, positive school climates can over time mitigate um, the disaster related impacts of uh, academic performance whether those are natural disasters, a pandemic, um, summer slide, um, all of those types of things have tremendous effects on, on bringing students forward. Um, so Raina, anything, did I miss anything on those? I, and you know what, this, this is something that Raina and I worked on together. So Raina, on those two slides, did I miss anything there? I, I want to no. include this. And I, and I think, you know, the, the, the presentation I just said is, is the what, and, and this really kind of summarizes the why, um, of, you know, why we're, we're trying to get as much information as we can from all of our groups to, to see what we can accomplish here. 
in terms of um, making sure we can, you know, uh, give the most appropriate supports for our kids. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's always, I, I like to lead with the research to show what's happening out there and why it's happening. Um, but, but so here's the first area that we looked at. We looked at behavior referrals in our schools. Um, and so, you know, hey, we, we want to see, well, you know, what's happening with our kids. Um, you know, and I, I can remember um, early on my wife and, and I, and, you know, forgive me for always going to my, my own anecdotals, but I learned so much from my own children. Um, you know, when I was in, a, in my quarantine for 18 days, I, I learned a lot about teaching and learning, watching my wife teach virtually second graders and watch my four children have to learn everything from organic chemistry as a junior in college down to sixth grade literacy and math and social studies and science. Um, so it, it was amazing to me um, to take that learning and then come back to work and, and, and think about these things. But my wife had asked me uh, about a month and a half ago, she said, you know, our 16 year old doesn't want to go to in-person school. And she said, I don't get it. I couldn't wait to be in school. I loved being in school when I was 16. And I said, honey, I, Th this is very different than anything you can imagine. Because if you look at the data, we're talking about 110 referrals in one mark, the first marking period in the 1920, 1919, 1920, uh, 2020 school year. And this year, three referrals. We're talking about 61 in the middle school and one, 56 in Clayton Huey and 17 for only 10 students have been written up. So interesting data, but school is not operating like school typically is. Kids are not being kids in some ways. We didn't come up with a magical elixir that got kids to behave. A <laughs> pandemic did this because we put masks on them and we socially distanced them. Um, so Rainy, you wanna go through the, the, the this slide? Yeah, so the building administration, you know, we asked them for numbers, but we also said, you know, give us some anecdotal information in terms of what, you know, the rationale, like, why do you think the numbers are what they are? Um, you know, I mean, the density, especially at the secondary campus, the social distance, pro the social distancing, um, it's reducing student interaction. You know, we have regulations everywhere um, where, you know, we have you know, bathroom sign in, and we're really, really limiting students, you know, in terms of movement, whether it'd be typical in the hallways at certain points of time to have more movement. Um, and, you know, it's, it's definitely a very limiting environment. Um, and, you know, from the positive set, the, from the positive side, you know, I think our, our students, even if we were not you know, really over communicating the boundaries and the rules and the limitations and all the protocols. Um, you know, the especially the older ones who are old enough to understand like what's happening in the world. Like they they are kind of um, operating um, because they know that they have that sense of self that they have to be more careful. You know, they're on edge, and that's not necessarily a positive thing. But they've developed this this different sense of responsibility. Um, and it, so that's what I see the po positive part of different sense of responsibility. Um, they're on a little bit more on alert um, and it, it could even be protective mode. Um, um, but now it's, it's kind of built into them, but they have to be more careful. And um, so maybe following rules is built into that, um, you know, stronger sense of being a responsible young adult. Um, you know, some of the things that I think that have helped us, you know, the building administration regularly communicating, getting on the loudspeaker, our teachers and staff reminding students of protocols and so forth, um, definitely have, have an effect on, um, you know, the, the protocols that are being followed. And um, that, you know, I think that their, their behavior is definitely um, also a product of just, you know, understanding what being well really is. Um, so, you know, we're seeing these positive behaviors. So some of it is because they're limited and they're afraid, but other parts of it is because they've, you know, they have this greater sense of responsibility, which shows that they're, they, they really do, um, you know, react well to, to stressful situations.
Yeah. And I, and I would say over the summer, you know, when we were building our plan, you know, we were thinking, oh my gosh, we're, we're going to have to put discipline protocols in place for kids who refuse to wear their masks. And <laughs> we had all these thoughts about what could possibly happen. And, and, you know, we've been looking at our compliance in mask wearing and social distancing and all that. And what we're saying is, you know, even mask breaks that we thought you ha- we would have to do. Oh my gosh, how often should we do mask breaks? We're going to have to do it every half an hour with little ones. The little ones don't even bat an eye. You know, the kindergarten kids can put a mask on and leave it on all day because they're just resilient. It's common practice now. So very, very interesting. Um, the next thing we looked at was attendance. And, you know, and so attendance, you know, we were scratching our head a little bit on this one because um, it was, it, it was curious to us um, some of the, the way the numbers played out. So the metrics we used, you know, were, were variable on here. Um, you know, so we used the, the one month full day absence at Clayton Huey, you can see. Um, doesn't look like a huge difference, the 550 to 500. A um, little bit of a reduction in absences. Again, um, there are instances where children are not in school. You know, uh, we are, parents are doing what we're asking. If we, you know, if, if a kid's got a sniffle, they're keeping them home because they don't want to be putting their child in a position where they could potentially um, be spreading any kind of disease in our schools. So they're keeping them home, but there's an option to log in at home. So the absences are down a bit. um, And we see absences down about 50 um, over the course of that one year. However, what we are seeing is the number of students with excessive absences. The absences are happening with certain kids. So we had in, 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 an instance where there were only four kids with 15 or more absences. Um, now we're seeing 20 kids with four or 15 or more absences. So, it, you know, do the math on that, you know, right there, that's, that's, you know, 400 absences right there, roughly between those kids with, with 15 absences um, in 2020, 2021 already in Clayton Huey. Um, when we look at the middle school, we have the one month full day absences at 257 down to 93. Again, that looks like a good trend because kids have the ability to attend school, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, even though they're not physically present. Um, however, you can see excessive absences are also significantly up. Um, so when you see upwards of a, you know, 45% increase in excessive absences, that's, that's cause for concern. Um, and, uh, you know, you see the, the trend in the high school, one month full day absences um, from 41 down to 36. Kids are finding a way to get into those classes and attend class. Um, it's a remarkable decrease in full day absences. However, uh, we do see a slight increase in the excessive absences. Oh, that's me calling, guys. Guess what I'm calling about? (laughs) (laughs) So feel free to check your text messages. Look at the funny snowman, whatever. Um, But uh, but that that would be me calling you to let you know that, yes, indeed, tomorrow will be a uh, good old fashioned time on a tradition snow day in America um, for Santa Mauritius. Um, So I did hear a couple phones go off and I saw my my cell phone light up. Um, so we are seeing, you know, an increase in, in the excess of absences. Um, you know, one of the things, one caveat to all this is while we are seeing the decrease in the, um, full day absences, one of the concerns we have is the level of engagement that they're actually in when they're in the remote classes. So I'll let Raina, as she talks about the pandemic effects on attendance, the observations and supports touch on that. Yeah, so, and, and, and the re- one of the reasons why we ran the data two different ways is because, you know, it, it is, you know, great that the kids have the opportunity to be present physically or remote. Um, but we also knew based on our CST information, our attendance letters and the volume that we're hearing from the buildings that th- those numbers did not line up. And that's why we ran excessive absence. And that's a, a period by period thing. So there's a daily absence and then there's a period by period absence. So those period by period absences can really rack up quickly if you have a full day absence. Um, So even though they may have that option, that opportunity to be present, um, whether they're in class or remote, um, the 
the real voice is from when the teachers are struggling with kids who may be present on the screen, they're logging in, um, but it's present versus engagement um, that we're hearing from them, that that is the challenge where um, they might be handing in assignments, um, but when they're calling on kids in class, um, they're realizing they're not engaged. Um, so, you know, we're trying to figure out, you know, like we, yes, they are logging in, but it's the engagement that we truly care about. I mean, that, you know, being present when you're physically there, look, you can come to class and put your head down and we address that. So we're kind of finding ways to address this as well. It's, you know, if you're not interacting when you're, you know, or at least responding in some way when you're, you're in your live synchronous session remotely, um, you know, where are we equating that with maybe putting your head down and, and, and not participating in class? Um, and, you know, the, the, the power of being in person, you know, teachers are really feeling that because it's, you know, hey, reminder, you didn't respond to my question during class. Like it, it's very limiting when you have just that, that element of virtual interaction. Um, so we are continuing with our communication regarding attendance. Um, a very, you know, our attendance at the secondary campus in terms of we get, we have those attendance letters that go out um, automatically. Um, and we have been doing a lot of outreach with our CST uh, teacher counselor outreach for students with, with attendance concerns. Okay. All right. Um, child study team referrals. Um, and so, you know, here the first trimester, we're seeing um, no change in Clayton Huey um, in terms of that. However, at the middle school, um, we, we have a hundred percent increase in the, uh, child study team referrals. So lots of these, uh, lots of concerns there over many of these things are, are some of those things where we talk about those, you know, mental health conditions and kids being exacerbated. Um, and those things start to impact them in terms of their ability to learn in school. Um, clearly at the high school going from 88 to 126, um, there's a reason for that. Um, and we are seeing that, um, it, you know, the pandemic is having an effect on the number of referrals we're seeing for child study. Ron, I don't want to interrupt, but I'm going to. Can you just explain what a chi child study team referral is? Oh, yeah. So, you know, when, when we see a kid, uh, and thank you for that, Robin, I appreciate that. Uh, if we see a child struggling in some manner, um, you know, and we try to, and typically they could be, uh, you know, some behaviors that are, are you know, we're, we're concerned about, could be failures, it could be kids, you know, acting out in a certain way. Um, it could be them going to a counselor and saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that, I'm really struggling with X, Y, and Z. It's really gathering up all the people that work with the child to, you know, work as a team um, and the mental health and the mental health professionals lead this um, and trying to problem solve the best ways to support um, the student to make sure that um, you know the, the the supports that we put in place do what's necessary to bring them back to where we want to see them be. Raina? Yeah, and and this um you know this team meets weekly, um, so there may even be um, certain kids that are. Um, you know, call, called or, you know, reviewed every week to look at progress and so forth. And it may also be, you know, that, you know, typically if there were a few behavioral referrals or, you know, the beginning of an attendance issue, um, that they may not, you know, traditionally go out to child study right away because the attendance issue is going to be solved mm -hmm. one way. So we're trying to really streamline all of the issues through child study. So that definitely accounts for the increase. And we're trying to hit these issues as, as early as possible. Um, so if it's a tentative issue, we may have let that first letter go out, second letter go out for the communication because that sometimes resolves itself. But in this environment with all the challenges, we don't we want to hit things as proactively as possible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and we know just you know from you know from our counselors and just in conversations and how busy their schedules are. You know, like. Their social emotional needs overall have increased. You know, just the stress of this whole scenario, whether it's in school or outside in school. Um, and, you know, we're trying to make sure that I think, 
you know, we talked about the importance of being connected because um, if they're connected, they will more likely to engage in, you know, in academics. And, and that's really hard for kids right now and kids who didn't typically connect with academics, they connected in some other way, whether it's athletics or extracurricular um, and they don't have those avenues and they don't have that same motivation because that piece of their typical school life um, is not present right now. Um, but I can tell, I can tell you that the supports and the communication, you know, we're doing individual Zoom meetings with families um, when needed in terms of, um, you know, uh, home visits to make sure, you know, if, we're, if we can't communicate with families, we would, we will go to the home and, and, and see if they need support to see what's going on. Um, and, you know, if, if there's an, if there's a need for outside agency support, you know, we've been making those connections for families as well. Um, you know, to the extent that we can, we have, you know, advertised opportunities for students to connect to the school activities. There are some virtual clubs and things that I know the secondary campus um, has a, a list uh, posted on their website. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, you know, those things are limited, but those could be potential motivating factors for kids who are struggling, you know, with um, the current situation, the hybrid situation at the secondary campus. Um, you know, but they've really just been pushing like every single kid, if, if the and needs a specific motivator, what is that motivator gonna be for that student? Great. All right, um, academic performance. Um, and clearly, you know, this is part of where, uh, you know, I started was that, hey, the academic performance, we were anticipating that there would be um, that bit of a slide, sort of a, a you know, a, um, uh, a significantly greater impact than the, you know, in, in the summer slide um, than a typical June to September, given what we went through in March. Um, and, you know, so if we look at, at Clayton Hewitt, we look at the number of students that are not meeting grade level proficiency in literacy, okay? And I, I thought I had the word literacy in here, but I, I remembered that I wanted to make sure that I was emphasizing that. This is strictly literacy. Um, kindergarten to grade two, 17% more students are not meeting grade level proficiency in 2020 versus 2019. Um, and that's cause for concern. Um, in grades three to five, it's 20%. Um, so, you know, obviously kids have not made the progress um, that we would typically expect. Um, and so their learning trajectory has been altered by the pandemic there. Um, what we chose for the middle school and the high school is this idea of multiple failures um, in, you know, you know, for lack of a, a better way to, you know, to put it, that's just basically students who are struggling in any particular class um, in, in the, you know, for the first quarter. Um, so in 1920, in the middle school, there were 11 students that had more than one class they were failing in the first quarter. Um, and it's 52 in, uh, you know, this year. 45 in the high school versus 89. So that's pretty significant. Um, and that is something that we are obviously looking at and we're concerned about. And I can assure you that, you know, Melissa and Courtney and Jeremy and Marissa are having uh, conversations all, and the child study teams are fully engaged to have these conversations to try to determine what can we be doing to support these students, um, you know, so that, so that we can, you know, get them back where, where we want to see them. Uh, right. Can you just go back one slide, please? Cause I, I have a couple of questions. Yep. Um, so when we, you know, took a look at the data and the attendance data and, and the child study team and so forth. Um, did we go all the way back to what was it, March 13th of last year when the decision was made to close schools for the rest of the year? Because I'd love to see if there's a correlation between these percentages um, and the percentage of students that are um, higher, have a higher absent rate than others and some of the students that were referred to the child study team for those social emotional needs. You talk about, um, so you want to, um, you want to combine the data and exam. Well, I'm just curious, right? So we, we have 17% kindergarten to grade two, 20% grade three to five, right. an increase of 
41, uh, 41 students and then another 44 at the secondary campus. Do those correlate to students who were experiencing these attendance difficulties in the spring of last year when we went to fully remote um, oh. learning? Well, we, we would have to disaggregate it and look at every individual case and match them up. But I, but I would suggest that um, a, a large majority of these kids that are in the multiple failure would be those kids that are probably in child study team. Now. So one of, it, it's, it's not an exact answer, right. but what, what we did look at, and one of the reasons why we chose multiple failures because, the, because of the discrepancy from year to year, where like singular failures, it was, it was more similar from year to year in terms of the amount, like more typical. Um, so, you know, we took that as like, all right, a student who was maybe failing like only one class last year is now having multiple failures under this scenario. So that's why we thought that that was, um, like that was the, the measure to use because it did show the difference between um, last year under, you know, typical circumstances versus this year. Um, the other anecdotal piece that I would say is that, um, you know, to correlate, you know, say the academic performance and attendance, which we know has a strong correlation, the kids that are not connecting and not coming to school um, are typically, um, you know, are the ones who are having multiple failures. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have a question also. Um, with the child study referrals, the child study uh, team referrals, there was an increase, significant increase, but we had, it, it looked like the discipline, we were down a lot. So is that, there's no correlation to the child study referrals and behavior? Um, how is that, uh, like, I, I, how does that correlate or not correlate? Because I don't see it. Well, you can be referred to child study for a lot of different reasons. Right. So, you know, sometimes it's just, you know, is there a discipline issue? There could be a discipline issue, but a not an academic issue, like in a discipline issue that can't be resolved, you know, um, with, you know, a consequence and the student moves on, like that student may be referred to child study. Um, or it could be just an academic issue. They don't have to, you know, fall under attendance, discipline, and academics to be referred to child study necessarily. It, it basically, um, it's referrals of teachers, counselors, administrators, like kids that we need to develop individualized plans for to make sure that, and to make sure that they have the right support. So they don't have to hit all of those categories necessarily to be um, in under that, you know, the work of that team. Right. So if we if we're implementing, you know, w w when we look at res response intervention and how we're going to intervene, you know, typically you have a, a, a tiered system of interventions. Right. And, and so you have different levels of supports that students would get. Um, and, you know, you'd have your level one supports that are, you know, oh, OK, so like there's, uh, you know, maybe a. Um, you know, counselor support or, or something like that, then, you know, level two interventions would be a little bit more intense. You, you probably have more remedial support and, you know, um, smaller group and intensive counseling. Um, you know, and then you get your level three supports that would obviously um, be much more significant um, based on the needs of the individual child and child study team would be making determinations on the level of support needed for an individual case. Basically, you can you can kind of move the, the the levers on that little equalizer a little bit. You can increase the frequency of interventions. You can increase the d duration of interventions. You can in, in, increase the um, the ratio, you know, teacher to student, um, and all of these things are levers you can push to try to make sure that you're uh, putting interventions in place for kids that are most appropriate. Okay. Then my, my other question, Raina, with uh, regards to these numbers, the increase in multiple failures, I'm sure you've had these conversations. Is there something that we could be doing, um, you know, as a board of ed or in, as a team to provide teachers with additional support for this hybrid and remote platforms? Um, uh, because I, mean, I, know, I know how much they are have packed into a single school class period as it is, and some of the other responsibilities 
that have shifted just due to the remote platform being part of our learning, you know, attendance wise and so on and so forth. So if, I don't know if you've had those conversations, but if there's something that we could do to support them, um, you know, that's certainly something that I would love to know and have a conversation about. Absolutely. Um, and I think if, I don't know, Ron, you ready to move on to the next slide? Might have a few answers or, you know, yeah, to, to, to but still, okay. Um, I mean, it, it's interesting and it, and it sounds, I know we talked about it, but one of the asks and it, um, it sounds pretty simple, you know, in our world of education, it's like extra help. It's a built in thing, but you know, extra help was a struggle. Um, having the ability to offer in person extra help. I mean, you know how important, if you get that extra help that day, you had the problem in class, you go to extra help, it's it's immediately taken care of where the way we had originally had it because we didn't have the in-person extra help. That's gonna be a game changer for you know a, a bulk of a bulk of students who need that immediate extra help. So that's one piece that I think that that shift in the last look back period is gonna be very, very helpful um, at the secondary campus. Um, mm -hmm. I I think the other piece and what I'm hearing, you know, from the buildings is, you know, they're really developing and you can see on this slide, um, they're really developing these individual plans for these students, um, those who are referred to CSTU with multiple failures. And, and some of them, some of them, you know, the feedback from the teachers and or the, and the counselors involved in these um, kind of group Zoom meetings with students and families, um, is it's, it's simple things like you've been missing your first and second period class because you're not setting your alarm. You know, some of the measures are very, very simple. Time management skills, you know, for some of our younger students is, is still, you know, a, a, you know, a major um, area of their life that they, they need to attend to and, and need to be, you know, specifically, you know, instructed. Um, setting very specific goals, um, it's weekly counselor check-ins to make sure that they're completing their classwork, you know, beyond, you know, the teacher communication piece. Um, and some of it is more, you know, very specific traditional uh, academic supports, like, you know, you're, you're going to get AIS support and, and, and so forth. So those are some of the things that we've done, but I'll certainly, um, you know, talk to the group in terms of what are the things we can do collectively uh, to support. Yeah, please, please, please do that, right? Because like that slide in your last presentation said, if we have to, if there's something in the environment we need to improve, we have to, we have to be able to provide that support for the, for the teachers as best that we can. Um, and again, I know, I listen, I know firsthand this platform and uh, from the education side as well. So I know how much they're packing into a period and I, I just want to make sure that we're as supportive for them as possible so that they can provide the best support for our students as well. Um, yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. And you know, that your perspective on the parent end, the board end, the teacher yeah. end is it's a hundred. I mean, they are a hundred percent. They really, yeah. really are packing in the material and balancing, you know, the, the new managerial parts of the platform, which are challenging as well. And knowing that, you know, they're, they're, you know, trying to keep on top of their content. Right. And get, and get kids, you know, preparing for the next, the next level, the next, next year at this point, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, we had the health and wellness safety committee today, and I just sh shared a little story that I always start every period off. I ask the children how they are. They're sixth graders. They're not generally forthcoming. They're not going to tell me in front of a group of 30, you know, so it's like, Hey, we're good. We're good. And today, one young lady asked me how I was, and that generally does not happen. Um, and, you know, I had a moment of reflection there, and I said, you know, overall, I guess I'm okay. You know, and even watching some of this stuff now, it's amazing what we've accepted as a reality for us. We're talking about, um, as part of the testing protocol, the number of hospital beds that are available. And we just accept it as part of our reality now. And when you look at it, it's, it's to me, it's just so such an extreme thing to have to think about, um, you know, and that's kind of what I was saying before where, where I hope we don't have to implement the testing plan. It's not that I don't think we're prepared, whereas we're so prepared for that. It's that I hope the numbers don't get that high. I hope that everybody is safe. I hope that we can start providing children with an education that when this girl asked me today, I realized how much I missed it, 
having all 25 students in my class, you know, this is the time of the year we'd, by now we'd be firmly established in our relationship, their relationships with each other. We'd have some group work going, we'd have holiday music going on in the background. And, uh, you know, today was a full remote day and it really just hit me really hard and then have to sit through all of this stuff and see the struggles of our children and of our teachers and, um, of our community. It's just, uh, you know, it's a tough, tough thing. So anything that we can do, anything that we can do, um, you know, I certainly want to make sure we explore that and provide it to the best of our ability. I appreciate that, George. So, you know, thank you for all, for, for all of those uh, presentations. But like I said, it's just so, so tough to sit through it, for me at least. Uh, you know, I'm not speaking for anybody else. But, you know, I, I think the, the good news is, and, and it, you know, if we go back to where I started with, with the resilience piece, is that if we remember the accelerate, not remediate piece, that we really need to focus on that and not, not lower the bar and not accept that kids aren't where we wanted them to be, but bring them to a place. And, and, and I also believe that when we get beyond this and when we get on the other side, that we truly are going to be better at what we do. Um, and, and when we are in person and we are lever leveraging all the things we learned here, um, I think we're going to, we, as, as an educational institution, we'll be better for it. Um, and our teachers uh, have learned so much during this time that they'll be able to carry the kids and, and do just that and accelerate, not just remediate. <clears throat> Thank so, you. Ron, Ron these, you. these negative impacts, especially from the, the pandemic, are, are really crucial. And, and mm -hmm. I'm glad you guys identified them. I'm glad you've identified actions, um, but, but they're really important. So I'm assuming we'll, after the next marking period, we'll go over these again in February or March timeframe and see what they look like. We, yeah, the, the, these are things that, that we've, we are keeping, you know, constant watch on. Um, you know, we've, we've talked about these in our administrative council meetings and we talk about these with the principals and, and you know, all the time, uh, you know, Raina most significantly has a lot of these conversations. Um, but yeah, we, we will continue to track the data and monitor it and um, continue to, you know, push to, you know, put plans in place that are going to benefit our kids. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we're, um, you know, we're about an hour and a half in and, and, and the superintendent's report's almost done. Wow. <laughs> uh, um, we do have, a, a, you know, we do have some, some committee reports. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, very, we'll do these as quickly as possible. Um, you know, the um, legislative committee met, um, um, you know, we, and, and yesterday I actually um, was kind of going to follow up today, but we didn't, we didn't catch up today. Um, but we met with um, legislators, all of the Long Island delegation that was available yesterday as a, a superintendent association. Um, and we really, you know, again, it's about building the partnership. It's about talking about the things that are most important. You've heard me talk about the flexibility um, that we need, some of the flexibilities we need. Um, the, our legislators are certainly supportive of that. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, to a person, they were really receptive. Um, there are some new electeds. Um, that actually made it into the meeting also. So that was good. Um, and so we do have a couple of things coming up. The, um, the Longwood Legislative Breakfast, um, we did send an invitation out. So we'll just figure out how many of the board members want to attend. Um, and that will be another opportunity to ask some questions of some of our electeds um, and continue the advocacy. All right. Um, Ricardo, you had a couple you want to touch on? Yes. Yes. Thank you, um, Dr. Masao. Yes, we have two, and I'll try to, as uh, Juan indicated, I'll try to make them as quickly as possible. We met as a technology committee on December 1st, and predominantly what we looked at was we created as a committee a technology survey, and it, it was um, directed to the staff, and we had some uh, very important questions to try to determine from the staff in terms of their use of technology, students' comfortability with technology. And it was a very simple uh, Google survey that we had. It was eight questions. And the major findings of it were the following. We had 76 of the respondents that felt very comfortable with technology, meaning the teachers feel comfortable utilizing technology in their instructional program. 47% uh, of the individuals that responded felt that technology met the demands of their instructional program, meaning that the technology that's available to them by the district uh, 
is able to meet the instructional needs. And I just wanted to uh, step back for a second because we had a uh, hundred responses for this survey. We have roughly 140 individuals within the CMTA unit. So that's a really good percentage of responses we received, which is roughly about 72%. The other piece that we looked at was a sort of a commentary section where we asked the teachers if we, they had the ability to sort of improve on the technology that's available to, to them, what would they look at? And some of the things that they identified is additional tech personnel, sorry, Carrie, um, smart board replacements. Uh, we know that we have quite a few smart boards across the district that are at the end of life. So we are going to have to look at replacing them at some point. And um, one of the number one comments I think that almost everyone mentioned is that they would love to see more Chromebooks uh, in the hands of students. So we are looking at that. I think the, the community is aware that the Board of Education generously supported the purchasing of 450 additional Chromebooks a couple months ago. Over the summer, we purchased another 100. And um, over the uh, spring and summer of this year, we actually had 199 donated. So we are actively working towards building our stock of Chromebooks across the district, which is a great thing. And the other piece that we looked at, the other question that we had for teachers was really how did they feel, uh, how comfortable the kids were with the use of technology. And the information, it's kind of interesting in the sense that at the elementary level, which I guess I, I, it wasn't too surprising to us as a committee, but 40% of the members that responded felt that their students were uh, felt comfortable, meaning 60% of the students did not feel as comfortable as 40% um, of their population. At the middle school, which is not surprising, 81% felt that their students were comfortable utilizing technology in the instructional program that we're offering. And at the high school, which is, was a little surprising to me, 67% felt that they were comfortable with the use of technology. I, I actually thought that that number would be a lot higher uh, yeah. considering the fact that, you know, most of our high school students are so uh, computer savvy and technology savvy. They always have a Chromebook or, you know, a, 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 some type of tablet or a cell phone that they're using to navigate through their lives. But that was the, um, uh, the findings from that particular survey future agenda items that we're going to look at as a committee is a review of the end of life hardware across the district. We know that one of the things that you have to continuously look at in technology is the replenishment of technology. Most standard Chromebooks, the end of life is usually three. We try to push them to four years, but um, technology is definitely not made the way it used to where you would have a laptop for seven or eight years and you still utilize your desktop, now the end of life is roughly about three to four years. So we're looking at that. We're also looking at the use of software across the district and how the redundancy of the software, meaning uh, are teachers utilizing same software that pretty much does the same thing? And can we reduce the cost of that? And possibly even we allocate those funds to better support the needs of our students and the needs of our teachers in their instructional program. So that was the technology committee, which was conducted on the 1st of December. The other committee is the uh, diversity, equity and inclusion committee, which met on December 3rd. And I'm happy to announce that it seems like every time I have a committee meeting, the membership continues to grow. And the membership is growing um, from the perspective of students, which is great to see. We've had I believe it was seven to eight students at our last meeting. And I think it's continue, it's, it's going to continue to grow, especially as the word gets out that, um, that we're looking at great work and we're looking at uh, um, analyzing what is being done in the district and trying to improve it, which is some of the things you heard today during um, Dr. Mas uh, Massaro's and Ms. Angolia's presentations. But some of the things we looked at, we did have, we, we are continuing our, bo our book talk regarding a book called Stamp that looks at um, uh, the history of racism in the United States and looking at uh, presenting an anti-racist viewpoint 
and endorsing it and really having ownership of that viewpoint within yourself and within an organization. The other thing we looked at is Dr. Masara and I back in November attended a really interesting webinar. Uh, and it was entitled uh, Bridging the Equity Divide Through Board Policy. And what we did is that for the committee, we presented the material that was presented to us at the webinar. And predominantly, it was three documents that the webinar presented to us, and, and it was sample uh, policy, sample regulations, and sample definitions that were created by the New York State um, School Boards Association. So we looked at that in, in the hopes that in the future, as a committee, we can possibly build something like that for Senator Marichas and bring it to the board for, um, uh, for review and, and, and possibly adoption. And it's, it's, a, it's a way to sort of look at the committee from the perspective in the beginning of the committee, when we began the committee in October, our first meeting, we looked at the definition and the perspective of DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, and what it meant to us and what does it mean to a school district. Now we're looking at data and we're looking at actions that can bring about reality into the um, definitions of DEI and make it uh, a viable, um, tangible entity within our district. So we looked at that. The other things that we looked at is we talked about the no place for hate designation, which is a designation that is provided to districts by the Anti-Defamation League. We uh, I think when Juan and I originally talked about it, I think we had sort of like an aggressive timeline. And when I began to really look at the logistics and the, and the specifics on implementing it, uh, we realized that I think we might be under the gun in terms of trying to implement it this year. So we did um, come to a decision as a committee to put everything in place this year for full implementation in the 2021-22 school year, which will be September of next year. And I, and I think we feel very comfortable with that. The other thing that we looked at is uh, the development of a DEI specific survey. I know that Raina talked about the school climate survey and of course the uh, SEL survey that we are going to look to do in the, in the community. But when you look at the school um, climate survey, which I think is awesome, I mean, it looks at so many different components from uh, whether or not your buildings are clean, whether or not um, bullying is taking place in the buildings, it looks at so many different great things, but there is, a, there is a portion of it that looks at DEI specific things, like in the student survey, I believe there's nine questions that look at DEI specific things. And in the uh, student um, survey, there's 12 particular questions that look at it. So I don't believe that the committee's intent would be to replicate that, but maybe look at some of the things that the school um, climate survey didn't touch upon so that we can create a survey that uh, it, uh, of things that aren't touched upon and the survey will go out to students maybe six to 12, we haven't decided yet, as well as parents, as well as staff to get their perspective on DEI as it exists in the San Mauricio School District. Uh, uh, the other piece that we looked at is I'm going to join a professional learning community. Uh, and it's um, something that was created by BOCES. It's BOCES actually hired a director of diversity, equity and inclusivity a woman by the name of April Francis Taylor. And what she is doing is she is going to conduct professional learning community uh, conversations once a month with individuals within different districts that um, are responsible for sort of facilitating the DEI conversation in their district. And the purpose of it is to just sort of get an idea of what other districts are doing, to get resources, to get understanding, and to kind of share ideas so that uh, maybe we can glean some things that other districts are doing successfully. And um, sometimes you don't necessarily need to have to reinvent the wheel to do something that's productive, especially if data is behind it that shows that it has been productive in another district. So I'm looking forward to that. The first meeting I believe is January 6th. 
So, and it's, I think it's the day before the next DEI meeting. So I'm looking forward to reporting back to the DEI committee in terms of what was covered during that meeting and future agenda items is we're gonna continue our book talk on Stamped. We're going to continue uh, reviewing uh, a draft survey and continue our conversation around building and equity policy regulations and definitions that eventually we would love to present to the board for its consideration. I think that was it. Right. Thank you, Ricardo. You're welcome, George. All right, thanks, Ricardo. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Raina, anything or Kerry or? Any other committee reports? The um, Health and Safety Committee met, sorry, on, um, I think it was last Thursday we met and we just briefly went over the status of all of our emergency drills that we have to have done before the end of this month, as well as um, the future drills. Uh, we are so far in compliance. Uh, I think the buildings had a few more that they were finishing up this week and next week. One built, each building I think had one left. Um, we are reviewed the um, strobe light system that the committee asked for information on. Unfortunately, it's cost prohibitive right now at about $60,000 for the district. So we do have the proposal on the back burner for future um, review. And um, I think that was pretty much it. Am I missing anything on that one, Ron? When we, do, when we do the drills, we do it for one cohort. We do the same drill for the other cohort. Correct, they do them uh, twice a week. Each cohort gets the same drill. Yep. Um, Rain, anything? Uh, we're just, uh, for facilities, we haven't met, but we're gonna schedule our next meeting after we get the BCS back from BBS. So we're just waiting on that <laughs> and then we'll schedule our next meeting. Got it. All right, and I know George- you glossary of terms with all of these <laughs> initials. Yeah, BBS, 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 BBS. Yeah, and, you know it's. Yeah, I know, George. You were you were mentioning on this committee meeting earlier today. I, unfortunately, I was not able to attend that one. Um, and I know, I know, Courtney's on. Old Courtney, maybe just give us a, an update. Um, this is much later than I think she probably anticipated, so I'm not sure if she's still there. I'm still um, here. I, <laughs> I can't turn my video on though for some reason, but I'm still here. Okay. So we've met, uh, you guys can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So we've had three meetings. We have about 16 members. I'm happy to say that I think we have a really good representation of different stakeholders throughout the district and community members. Um, our focus is just, uh, we're reviewing our current wellness policy and we're looking at how to enhance it. We too uh, want to align a lot of the initiatives that Mrs. Angolia spoke about uh, tonight into our wellness um, policy or future changes to our wellness policy. So some of our agenda topics have included mm -hmm. professional development, focused on social and emotional learning initiatives for our staff, outreach to students and families, especially pertaining to a lot of what you uh, heard about earlier regarding child study team and how we're reaching out to our students during this challenging time. Using those SEL screeners, helping um, our staff and students learn more about self-care um, and looking at the resources that are in our community um, that can help build awareness on overall wellness, not just physical wellness or health or, you know, physical health, but social and emotional wellness as well. Thanks, Gord. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, if anybody wasn't aware, we will be having a snow day, a traditional snow day tomorrow. Um, so uh, please enjoy it, but stay safe if you go outside. Um, you know, stay with your family, social distance, but build a snowman and dress it up like a Santa Merch's Pride and send us a picture. <laughs> Thank Hashtag you, Ron. Positivity. I'm sure everybody's looking for, forward to that spontaneous break. I think so. I know we're, we're, we're going on break next week, but... Uh... An unanticipated one is always a, a, a treat. Yeah. I almost wish we got the call in the morning. 
Even more. No. Than that. It was exciting. <laughs> Not at 5 a.m. This was Friday. Well, like I, I'll tell today. you what. I put it on social okay. media. I put it on social media first. And I'm and I'm hearing that, that that some of the teachers are not happy that I didn't put it out to them first. And I said, it, it's the only way to build your fan base. You have yeah. to get your followers up by putting it on social media first. <laughs> and, and you know, within an hour they got their word. So, but but I understand there was some chatter behind the scenes about about yeah. me not not letting the staff know first. It was a surprise to me. <laughs> and I thought you were a loyal follower, George. Nah. No, I keep my uh, I keep my personal account separate from my uh, volunteer and professional account. No. I follow you, but it's it's on the down low, Ron. You know what I mean? <laughs> we'll build you an alias. Yeah, you know what? If I have if you follow too many people, it's impossible to keep up with your timeline. So too all much. my spots are taken right now. So then I visit. <laughs> if I have some to drop out, I'll add you. You know, I, I think maybe, maybe we'll take this offline, George, because I don't yeah. know that I really want to have this conversation now. Yeah. No, but the snowman was great, Ron, and I, hopefully everybody gets a chance to see that. So uh, certainly, certainly appropriate. 